Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. And joining us today is Matt Ridley. He's a journalist, businessman, and author of the best-selling book, The Rational Optimist, How Prosperity Evolves, which I should point out has a proud place on Libertarianism.org's short list of books you should read to understand libertarianism. He's also the author of the new book, The Evolution of Everything, How New Ideas Emerge. Welcome to Free Thoughts. Thank you for having me on the show. So let's maybe start by talking about the connection between Rational Optimist and this new book. Rational Optimist was a book in which I surprised myself by writing a book about progress and deciding that actually it had been far better than I ever even dreamed, that in my lifetime the average income of the average person on the planet had trebled in real terms, their lifespan was up by 30 percent and the amount of child mortality was down by two-thirds and that on the whole, uh, despite what we all thought and how gloomy we all were about the world, we were healthier, wealthier, happier, cleverer, cleaner, kinder, freer, more peaceful and more equal than we thought. Uh, sorry, than we had been uh, 50 years before. So I catalogued these extraordinary improvements. But I didn't just stop there. I also tried to explain where they'd come from and how they, how they arose. And of course, in a word, they came from innovation. They came from innovation in technology, but also innovation in habits, so tools and rules, if you like. Uh, and uh, trying to understand what why innovation happens to human beings uh, and not to rabbits or to rocks was part of the motivation of that book uh, and it's one that I carry on in, in the current book as it were and particularly the idea that came out of Rational Optimist was that basically it's about recombining ideas that, that you take two ideas meld them together and make a third idea or rather they may meet and mate and have a baby idea perhaps uh, and that's where most ideas come from is the, the cross-fertilization of thoughts between different people and that's a sort of equivalent to a biological process called sexual reproduction uh, which is a key ingredient of evolution. Uh, so I then got interested in how uh, evolution is actually a very good description of how society changes as well as uh, how – um, biology changes. Now, for for you personally, because I, I had been familiar with your work with the Red Queen and things like this beforehand, uh, when you're doing straight up evolution stuff, when you started doing Rational Optimist, was this? Did you surprise? Did what you found surprise you? And and where you went on this journey to like how big evolution can be from where you started originally? Yes, I did. I, I I certainly, you know, a long while ago, wouldn't have thought that evolution was was a apt way of describing how human society changes because I thought human society changed because clever people told it how to change. Uh, it was commanded and controlled. It was top down. It was uh, ordered. It was planned, uh, etc. As I grew up, I became less sure of that, shall we say, uh, and I began to notice that actually an awful lot of change in society consisted of uh, emergent, gradual, incremental unnoticed, unplanned change uh, and that actually all the good things were like that and all the important things were like that too. And sure, it was possible to plan something, to command something uh, in, in the way of change but actually uh, the really interesting things like the change in the birth rate or the change in living standards were not the result of deliberate policy. Um, and then I realized that the Adam Smith Friedrich Hayek view of uh, the human world, that is to say that spontaneous order emerges from the interactions of individuals, is exactly the same point as the Charles Darwin view of the biological world, that uh, sophisticated fit between form and function and complex design emerges from a, 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 an interaction among um, individual creatures and individual genes without a designer. Now, you describe the Darwin theory then if we broaden our view of evolution as the special theory of evolution, uh, sort of paralleling relativity and, and so that there's a general theory of relative – or evolution, sorry. So how does that, how do, how does that break down? Yeah, this was a, an idea that a friend of mine suggested to me when I was preparing the book, uh, uh, Richard Webb, uh, that um, – uh, you know, was was I proposing a general theory of evolution as opposed to a, a, a special theory of evolution? And I like the the concept, so I've used it in the uh, in the book. And um, what I mean by that is that we used to think that evolution, in fact, a lot of people still do think that evolution is a is confined to genetic systems, that you have to have genes in order to be an evolutionary system. That that's the characteristic feature of things with genes and it's also the characteristic feature of evolutionary systems that they have genes. Uh, 
I don't think that's true. I think any information system, because genes are particles of information, uh, any information system is capable of evolutionary change. If there is an element of randomness in the way it changes, an element of trial and error, if you like, and if there's an element of selection, and clearly both are true um, of uh, human society, that, that we, we try things. We don't, we don't come up with a single solution. Um, we, we, you know, different people come up with different solutions uh, and we get the opportunity to pick through the market or through choice or, or even through democracy. We get the opportunity to pick the ones we like and reject the ones we don't like. Uh, and so in that sense, evolution by natural selection is going on among ideas, among thoughts, among habits, among technologies, uh, among morals, among gods, uh, among Bus businesses, businesses, and, yeah, exactly. governments, yeah, a lot of yeah. things. Yeah. So there's a lot of unconscious incremental change uh, driven by evolution in human society. Is it fair though to think of like a spectrum of – from outright creationism to outright like algorithmic evolution where on the one end, on the biological, we've got – you know, there's – this is random choice, random selection. There's random mutations and they're checked against things in the world. Does the organism die? Does it live long enough to breed and so on? Um, but cultural evolution seems like a weird halfway point perhaps because it's not entirely random. It does have agency. Like there are intelligent designers making design choices like I am going to try doing this thing instead of what we were doing yesterday and then there's a selection process but the selection process is also being done by intelligent selectors who are themselves intelligent designers. So does this – does it look just like biological evolution because I can imagine it being weirder. It's certainly true that, that we are trying to improve the world in a way that um, Darwinism isn't I – mean, biological Darwinism isn't trying. Uh, and you know that we can we we can plan some something, and our plan might be a good plan, and it gets selected. So in that sense, there is consciousness, there is purpose, there is aim in in, in human in the human world. It would be foolish to deny that. What I'm saying is that to a surprising extent, that's a bad description of, of, of how we do change the world because yes, people come up with ideas for how to improve it. But what really matters is having competition between those ideas and some of them surviving and some of them, some of them failing. Let me give you a very nice example that was given to me by Dan Dennett, the evolutionary philosopher. Um, uh, and it's a quote from an early 20th century French philosopher by the name of Alain. He went by one, one name. Uh, and, and he, looking at the, the designs of boats in the Pacific Islands, he says – he thinks about it and he says, um, the badly designed ones sank and disappeared. The well-designed ones were copied. Uh, it was the sea that fashioned the boats. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, sure. Each person, when he built a new design of boat, was trying to make it a better one. But it was the sea that decided whether it was a better design or not. And then someone might come along and say, isn't it amazing that we all only have good bo good boats? There must be some principle of design by this. It's like, no, they're just not here anymore, like an anthropic principle kind of thing. That's right. Um, the As Douglas Adams said, you know, the, um, the, the the puddle says, isn't it amazing that this hole fits me so well? Exactly. Well, we, see, we see that in – I mean that would seem to explain to some extent the the constant culture and arts decline attitude of you know art and music and whatever else used to be good so much better way back when and that's largely because right now we're watching that process in action and we're we watching the, the good novels <laughs> and the bad novels being written but in the past, all we have left from that are the ones that were pretty good. That's a very interesting point and I think that's spot on. In other words, the, the, the second-rate Victorian novels don't get read. So we think, my goodness, they wrote good novels in Victorian <laughs> times, whereas today we have to labor through some, some dross in order to find the, the good ones. And the filter of history uh, is – you know, one of the reasons I like classical music is because it's been well filtered for me, <laughs> <laughs> if you like. Um, and of course, that's partly why we have rose-tinted nostalgia about the past is because we've we, we, we've only bothered to remember the good stuff um, and to preserve the good stuff. And uh, we compare it with the present and we think, God, you know, things went much better in those days. That's because we've left out the bad bits. Uh, and I, what I rather like about um, 
golden age nostalgia is that uh, if you go back to the the golden age, what the Greeks described as the golden age, you know, because they were already nostalgic for a time, and you go back to the time of Hesiod, eight centuries before Christ, you find that Hesiod was grumbling about how things aren't like what they used to be. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that has something to – it ties in in some way to something you talk about in the book, the sort of bias to purpose and the bias to design, which I think that we have when it comes to, say, creationism and biological evolution – uh, especially here in America where creationism is still pretty popular. But just in terms of human institutions in general. It's certainly, I think, true that we have a, a, a tendency to look for uh, – to, 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 to think things are more top-down than they are. It's, it's a common mistake uh, as it were, a reflex we have. Uh, and it, I mean it manifests itself in, in the way we uh, think inanimate objects are vindictive and think thunderstorms are revenge of the gods and that sort of thing. You know, it, 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 what Dan Dennett calls the intentional stance is, is, is a big part of uh, the, the way we view the world. I wouldn't see it necessarily so much as coming out of that golden age nostalgia thing that we were talking about as, as coming out of uh, a – uh, you know, if uh, evolutionary psychology would likely build in a hair trigger for intentionality, because uh, if um, you know, if if your friend bumps you and you're walking along a narrow path next to a big cliff drop and you almost go over, and he says, "Oh, sorry, that that was an accident," uh, <laughs> it, it probably makes sense to 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 say, "Oh, well, it was an accident." I mean, not to say it was an accident, but to say. Hang on a minute! You were trying to kill me, weren't you? <laughs> so it's, or to be, it's better that the, to preserve on to err on that side, or the, or the noise in the bushes is is someone coming to get you rather than the wind. Yeah, to err on the on the that, that's an even better example. It's slightly, slightly more plausible <laughs> example. as opposed to your friends <laughs> friends killing you. Uh, but p- perhaps another question that strikes me before we get into some of the details of your chapters is they're called the evolution of education, the evolution of money, a, a bunch of these things. But but does it also maybe require something I think about in libertarianism? in general, that you have to have some sort of faith in the quality and goodness of people, which, which in your prior work on, on evolution, you, you've written about virtue and things like this, that you, know, you might not be for bottom-up explanations if you think that people are just bad. Because bad people would create evolutionary things too. They would create the Thunderdome and Mad Max or something like this. Uh, so you have to actually believe that people are fundamentally good, kind of the Lockean versus the Hobbesian paradigm, that people are actually pretty good. So that was maybe an important part of this that some people who don't believe in bottom-up solutions, maybe the one reason they don't endorse them. That's a very interesting point and, and the way in which this argument intersects with the slightly older or parallel argument about the perfectibility of man, uh, etc., is I think – is in it, which is kind of I wrestled with in my book, The Origins of Virtue, is a, is a really interesting question. And you're quite right. Uh, the view that people only behave morally because they've been told to by priests or teachers uh, is not really compatible – with the view that people should be free to live their lives as they want. Uh, if you genuinely think that we would all kill each other were it not for um, uh, um, government being, telling being us told to, as yeah. children that that's the bad United idea. Nations, that's, that's who <laughs> keeps it from happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then of course you think that we must have um, benevolent dictators in charge of the world uh, because uh, the, the opposite is very dangerous anarchy. And I think most people go around with a view that – Anarchy, uh, the, the lack of rules leads to – Top-down rules. Lock, lack of top-down rules, exactly, as opposed to bottom-up emergent ones, um, leads to really bad outcomes in, in, in which um, horrible things happen. Uh, and, and on the whole, the evidence doesn't bear that out. I mean the, one of the things I like to do is ask people, can you name a country which you think has too little government? And some people say Haiti. Somalia maybe. So, yeah. But Haiti is not a good example because actually if you go to Haiti, you find it's extremely difficult to start a business because the regulations are so tight even in a, a sort of badly governed country like that. Somalia, well, actually it's got rather too much government. It's just that it's not a monopolistic government. It's several different warlords. <laughs> I, ask, I, mean. I ask students uh, when I teach these kind of emergent rule things if whether or not before Hammurabi's code, if they think that ancient Sumeria was just complete chaos with everyone just running around, kicking everyone, and until he came down and, and carved this in, that's what everyone – oh, OK. Well, let's stop. Well, no, no one actually believes that. Uh, exactly. People are pretty good at, at, at behaving themselves. Let's talk, let's talk about some of these actually. Aaron, did you have a- Yeah, I was wanted to start – I mean there's the, the paradigmatic case of what we think of as a 
totally planned – going back to the Hobbes and Locke, totally planned institution is government. You know, we, we got together and we created this thing in some distant past in order to protect our rights or do whatever um, and then we kept planning it and kept planning it until we got to today. Um, and But you say no, like even government is often the product of an evolutionary process. How does that work? Yes. Government is the emergence of a monopoly on violence. That that's pretty clear from both myth and history, and 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 also what we see around the world is that the characteristic of a government is that it's managed to monopolise violence, and so uh, and and therefore doesn't need to use it, keeps it in the background. Um, uh, and uh, what I think is rather interesting is that you can see this arrangement emerging ab initio from nothing in certain uh, institutions today. And the example I give in the book is prison gangs. Uh, prisons, prisons operate on a sort of um, – uh, you know, the various kind of rules emerge among prisoners about what's good and what's bad behavior. Um, and it turns out that at a certain level, a certain size of prison, a certain turnover of prisoners, these rules start to break down. Uh, and so what happens is that instead uh, you, you see gangs emerging within the prison and the gang says, um, you know, we're in charge. Uh, we decide what happens. We punish transgressors. Uh, and often this is very welcome to the prison authorities because they, they find that what's happening is that order is being brought in. But some quite powerful gang masters are emerging within the prison who are able to bribe the prison authorities, etc. Uh, so it, it's very parallel, I think. To, to and, 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 uh, but the point is it's not planned. You know, it, it – it, it appeared spontaneously. David Scarbeck has a very interesting book about this. But doesn't that cut against the the general idea that what's unplanned is good and what is planned is bad? If I mean, if your example of like, look, here's an unplanned thing: prison gangs. That doesn't sound all that encouraging. Well, prison gangs are better than um, uh, complete anarchy. I mean, you know, complete chaos in prison, which is is the point. They're a response to a, a much more dangerous and chaotic situation. They, they are a form of order emerging within within a prison. Sure, these are bad guys we're talking about because they're in prison. So, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about a problem of violence that is being solved. <laughs> now, another one of your chapters, you talk about uh, the evolution of education, which which is one of my favorite subjects. Uh, it wasn't the case that the, the before the state came along and said we're going to have schools that there that there were no schools. I mean, is that what seems people might think? Uh, but the story, the real story, is different. Indeed, and and the uh, literacy rates shot up uh, in the nineteenth century uh, in America, but also in Britain and, and other parts of Europe, uh, and indeed in India and places like that, uh, long before there was any edu public education policy or, or, or compulsory education or anything like that. Uh, why? Because there's an there was an, once people. You know, ordinary working people got sufficiently uh, um, uh, well off that they could afford to worry about these kind of things. There was an appetite to uh, to come to arrangements whereby their kids got in, got educated, uh, and so you see a huge progress, evolutionary progress. You know, emergence of education systems, uh, and then government comes along and says, "Look, it's." Disgraceful that we haven't got enough education. We're going to uh, impose a, a system from top down, and it's. It's not always clear that that was an improvement. Uh, in fact, it seems in many cases to have slowed down the evolution of, of, of education. Um, uh, sure, it's improved education in the 20th century and so on, but it's bound to because the resources were much more available. The wealth of the society was much greater. It would also have improved under a much more free system. Uh, so uh, you're also seeing that now coming back to haunt the the public sector education because of the ways in which people can can uh, use new technology to develop new forms of education. And I think uh, self-organized learning is an example of that. Sugata Mitra's experiments showing that kids with computers attached to the internet, as long as they're working in groups and as long as they're given certain well-posed questions by teachers, will teach themselves surprisingly well. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's a reminder that, that, um, that there are new forms of education that are much more bottom up that are going to emerge and of course the Khan Academy and things like that in terms of uh, using the internet to, to teach people. You know, the idea that that you should have a medieval structure well actually it's not a medieval, it's an 18th century Prussian structure where you have one 
guy standing at the front of the class and we're all sitting at desks. You know, that's not the only way to learn. It's just a – I hope not. <laughs> there has to be something different out there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that seems to raise it you know, another way of arguing that the other side of coming at the problem with the planned systems is – so we can – you know, on the one hand say like, look, if we begin with emergent processes, then we've got this selection process going on and it's going to weed out the things that don't work and the things that will work and that is better than hoping that one guy or one group of experts can get us to the right thing. But then on the flip side and we can see this with public education is even if the planners, let's say, get it right at the time, like they come up with sitting in you know early 20th century, we're going to come up with a system of education that will work for all Americans, the world changes a lot. And the problem with these planned things is the planners like to keep them the way they are and we tend to be stuck with them. Well, I think what that's teaching you is that monopoly is very bad at change uh, and that's because change comes from trial and error uh, in an evolutionary system. And uh, so letting a thousand flowers bloom and seeing which one is best adapted to the new technology, the new situation, the new background uh, is the best way of making sure that you don't get stuck in a rut and do the same thing over and over again. Or maybe the way of talking about it could be that – or another way of talking about it could be that the government, if you think about it as an ecosystem and you and you saw something in the ecosystem, an animal with an adaptation that seemed to be counterproductive or made no sense, you'd wonder what – like a peacock's tail, for example. You'd wonder what was the thing that allowed it to exist. And the government has this unique adaptation called the ability to use force, which is the ability – which is why it can have things continue to exist that no one even wants perhaps or a Prussian model of education 150 years after it's out of date because it has its own adaptation uh, to, to thrive in this world which is the ability to use force uh, in this in this specific way. Well, uh, back to the point about what government is, it's a, it's a monopoly on force as, as, as we said and uh, – the, the key word there is monopoly. I think you know that that it, it only government only pacifies a country because it's a monopoly. I mean, if if you had two rival monopolies on force of, uh, within a country, by definition, you've got a civil war. Uh, so uh, so in 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 it has to solve that problem. Government has to be a monopoly, but that produces another problem, which is that it can't evolve, it can't change. Uh, fast enough. Uh, it, it's not responsive enough to, to new environments and it doesn't experiment enough. Uh, it, it doesn't try new things. Uh, and uh, so, for example, political systems tend to be surprisingly long-lived. Um, they, they change with revolutions but they don't change much in between uh, and political reform is notoriously difficult to achieve. Uh, I make the point um, in the book that uh, if you brought Daniel Defoe who – you know, wrote about riding around England describing it in the early 18th century. If you brought him back today, 300 years later, he would find everything completely changed except government, which would be horribly <laughs> familiar. There's a, there's a constitutional monarch, there's a bicameral parliament, there's an unelected House of Lords, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's nothing depressing about that. <laughs> Is there a way though to introduce – evolutionary pressures into government? Because I mean we have a system right now where we you – know, at the global level, there is not a monopoly. There's no state that controls all of it and they are competing but the history of humanity is filled with destructive competition among states. It tends not to go well when two states compete with each other. Is there a way to get them more into an evolutionary process without it just being a series of wars? Well, David Hume made the point and a lot of people have uh, continued to make this point since that the reason Europe stole a march on China in the – from the sort of 18th century on, well, from the 17th century onwards was because it was fragmented politically and that meant that uh, during the Reformation and the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, uh, an, an individual inventor or, or talent of some kind could get up and leave if he didn't like the regime he was living in. And this happens all the time. I mean, if you go and look, you know, Gutenberg or the man who invented mice in China or whatever, you know, they often 
move from one country to another to, to find a regime that's more congenial for them to live under. So it's very favorable to innovation, to having a fragmented continent. And the reason Europe is always fragmented is because of its peninsulas and its mountain ranges. It's very hard to unify. A lot of people tried, Julius Caesar, Hitler, Napoleon, Charles V. Uh, none of them pulled it off for very long. Whereas China, which is a much more sort of concentric country with great big rivers running through it and and uh, without very much in the way of peninsulas, um, was very easy to unify. And although it's occasionally fragmented and its, its golden age was when it was a bit more fragmented, um, nonetheless, when it, it usually ends up being turned into an empire. And very clearly, when it gets turned into an empire, uh, it tends to stand still um, and uh, be actually anti-innovative because it gets a regime that's, that's too monopolistic. Uh, so war is the price that Europe pray, paid for being fragmented, uh, but innovation was the reward it got for being fragmented. On that, on that point, dovetailing off that, uh, is there a top-down bias in – or what we have purpose oh, of sorry, can I come back on one postscript Absolutely. to that? Because yeah. it's, it's an interesting thought. So where does America fit into that? In many ways, it looks like China. It's easy to, to, to unify as, as a North America I'm talking about. And, uh, uh, but, but of course, the answer is the federal structure gives you just about the best of both worlds. Um, a, a single monolithic country – but with an ability to have experimental governments within it. Theoretically, um, at least. Yeah, at, least right, right, at, at, yeah, at its best. At its best. Yeah. With, of course, the risk that that turns into a civil war over states' rights, which it does at one point. Um, but, uh, you know, at its, the, 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 the states as laboratories is a huge advantage of your system that most countries don't have. The, uh, so, yeah, the, the, the question I was asking was about uh, about history in terms – because we were bringing up history and you write in the book about sort of the, bi the same sort of bias that we have when we think of history, the top-down view of history as opposed to thinking about it as more organic. Uh, it kind of reminds me of some of uh, the Whig view of history that this Mises and, and uh, to discussed uh, that history is directed by people and has a – Purpose and it's going towards something. Usually, you know, centralization and nice, classy buildings. But, but yeah, how, how is there a bias infecting our view of history? Well, I think we believe in the great man theory of history too much. Uh, we tend to to say, uh, you know, brilliant George Washington. He won. He won the war. He created the nation. Yeah, and of course, he deserves some credit. But if you go back and look at uh, the surrender at Yorktown of the British forces, and this isn't a Brit complaining. A, 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 <laughs> I was a, a, just going to come back on that. Yeah, <laughs> you got you. sour grapes here. <laughs> <laughs> it's way in the past, and I'm very glad you won that war. And it was inevitable you were going to win that war. But that's kind of the point. Mm -hmm. But if you go back and look at what actually happened, the malaria parasite played a huge role in the surrender of the, the, that particular British army because uh, uh, the uh, um, Cornwallis had been ordered to, to to stay in the low ground around the Chesapeake Bay, and all his Three quarters of his army was debilitated when the battle happened, and that's true of Washington's most wars was historically. So, yeah, often death in the camps. Often is it's most either of it. economic or biological or uh, parasitic or something. The reason why a war gets won, but nonetheless, we say, I mean, Napoleonic wars. The, you know, Wellington wins not because he was a better tactician than Napoleon, but because Britain had the most money, um, and you know. The Allies did, as it were, uh, and, and in, you know, in the end, they were able to throttle Napoleon for that reason. So, uh, the, the the great man theory of history is that great men take history and turn it in one direction or another. And obviously, that can happen. I don't think anyone would deny that Hitler was a great man in the wrong sense of the word. Obviously, you know, in, affecting in, in, a lot of exactly. things. Exactly. I, I do not mean to imply that he was a good man. Of course, um, uh, but uh, on the whole. We overemphasize that. We don't take into account the inexorable, inevitable emergent forces and the degree to which your ordinary people are what's deciding the outcome uh, in the way they're behaving and trading and, 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 and so on. Uh, so I, I think you know, we, we, we give too much credit to the people on top of history rather than the people at the bottom of history. What about the role of innovators that we have? I mean so much of the, the really wonderful stuff that's improved our lives today came from – smart individuals making discoveries, whether that was Newton and I guess Leibniz for calculus or you know, the invention of whatever these things happen to be, all are from a single person. Vaccines, Vaccines canned food. Yeah, the but... iPhone I have in front of me. Well, there again, I think we overemphasize the great man. And by the way, and, you know, I'm not 
I'm not dissing these wonderful inventors, and I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of science. I'm a huge fan of technological in, invention. But look at you know, do you really think that if if uh, Google hadn't invented the search engine, we'd have no search engines? If Thomas Edison had invented the light bulb, we'd have no light bulbs. If 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 Newton hadn't discovered gravity, we would never discover gravity. If Darwin hadn't discovered natural selection, you know, it's inevitable. I mean, the, the double helix of DNA was bound to be discovered in the 1950s. The technology had reached the point where it, where it was inevitable. So in that sense, every single scientist and inventor is dispensable. You can do without them. You can even run over Einstein and uh, before he discovers special relativity and you still get special relativity because Hendrik Lorentz was on the trail and would have got there. Do you see what I mean? So – I mean, this sounds like I'm being very rude about these guys, uh, and 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 uh, but I'm not really meaning to. I'm just saying that that let's hear it for the ordinary technologists and and grunts who are sort of putting together the pieces that mean that actually this thing is ripe, uh, and someone's going to find it. Uh, and you know, let's celebrate the chap who find it, but let's not overdo it. The Nobel Prize tends to be, in that sense, very unfair because it selects the person who happened to be in the place to put the keystone in the arch or whatever it is. But can we can we advocate for, say, government funding of these institutions, understanding that there's a lot of des- uh, evolutionary bottom-up stuff, so say the Manhattan Project, who we had to get a bunch of people in there to, to share ideas but have the funding for them so they can share ideas, so they can come up with this and so many different false starts and we need to figure out how to do this. But at the end of it, we have nuclear weapons, which – Bad thing, uh, but probably going to come anyway. But nuclear power and all these things. So, so maybe government has a role in trying to direct this towards some sort of path. Well, certainly, whoever's in charge of society or whoever's taking the decisions uh, should do their best to create an ecosystem in which innovation happens. Absolutely. And what does that require? It requires, uh, you know, plentiful uh, movement of people, movement of ideas, trade, so that uh, things are coming into contact with each other. It requires resources. It requires stable infrastructure, etc. Now, does it require government pump priming? Yes, obviously, in some cases it does. But would it get uh, other kinds of pump priming, yes, that's true too. You know, in the first half of the 20th century, Britain and America were conspicuous by not spending any public money on science, whereas France and Germany did spend money on science, which were, t- were more successful. Arguably, Britain and America were more successful in discoveries in that period. So, uh, I think the 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 where the money d- comes from doesn't necessarily matter so much as how you make sure that the money and the people and the and the opportunities and the resources and the infrastructure are in place. Uh, and that usually these days is a role for government. But it doesn't sort of have to be. Well, that 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 they sort of had the follow-up question I had on here was was kind of based on that. If you kind of think – so we wouldn't advocate for emergent evolutionary stuff if say – an asteroid is going to hit the Earth. I mean, we'd want people to come in and plan and organize people and say, "Let's get the asteroid." I assume, or build the laser, or whatever. Well, it depends. Are you suggesting that um, we we know which technology we're going to use to, to head off the asteroid? Uh, uh, we, we want to make we, a we Manhattan need project. To, we just for need it. to. Well, yeah, but exactly. But what are you going to? Uh, do you need some experimentation to find out what technology to use to, to head off the asteroid? And that I think you know, this is climate change is the, is, is the, the thing here. Yeah. Should we be spending our money on R and D to come up with uh, cheap and abundant uh, low carbon energy, or should we be spending it on uh, uh, top down targets and plans? Well, I think we should spend it on R and D. You know, I think that's more likely to, to, to produce the results. So, so yes, if we know it's just a matter of putting together a ten billion pounds to, to solve the problem, then obviously we've got to club together and do that. But if we don't know what's going to solve the problem, then we should let a thousand flowers bloom. So one of the objections that I get when I make the thousand flowers bloom sort of argument, whether it's you know let's not centrally plan this but leave it up to the market or let emergent processes handle it is the sense that evolution seems to work pretty well um, and we can see that with biological evolution but at tremendous cost. You know, All of those mutations that failed along the way, all of those organisms that died out and when you're talking about people's lives in the real world, you know, so we, we say like a free market in healthcare will lead to all of these terrific innovations and lower costs and 
provide access to more people and it will be better, but we can't tell you the specifics because you can't tell the specifics about a market process. And the response is, well, OK, but what do I say to the person who needs the health care right now? You know, and the, the process hasn't provided something for him yet. But if we centrally plan it, maybe it won't be as good in the long run, but we can help this guy right now. It seems a lot to ask these people to be the cost for a yeah. evolutionary process. Yeah. But I think that's a false dichotomy because I don't think we're saying to the person with polio in 1950, we won't give you an iron lung because we're going to spend all our money on a vaccine. But we are we are saying let's see if there's a better way out there than simply designing a better iron lung. Uh, and it turned out there was. It was a vaccine. Uh, so uh, I, I think you can run both horses at once, as it were. Um, and yes, uh, evolution is wasteful and a lot of bad ideas fall by the wayside. But better bad ideas fall by the wayside than – People fall by the wayside, which is often the result if you if you try and do it by planning. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, it's hard to argue that centrally planned systems have not been wasteful. I mean, look at often they're very wasteful of human lives, whereas at least the the experimentation is wasteful of ideas, if you like. Uh, you know, look at the economy of South Korea. You know, uh, uh, sorry, North Korea. Um, uh, well, let's look at them both. South Korea uh, is an experimental place that tries lots of different things and uh, no doubt wastes a lot of um, electricity on advertising hoardings or something futile, uh, which North Korea doesn't. Uh, but North Korea certainly wastes human lives and human potential and human happiness. Uh, and so uh, I don't think that that's a, that's a fair argument because – you you can solve a problem pretty quickly with evolution often and get a better result and and the fact that it's disruptive often means that the people who are suffering the people who feel this pain and this waste are the inefficient ones who should be got out of the way anyway not not the people but the organizations i mean in in that, in that sense should be got out of the way anyway uh, so um uh, you know the the vested interests are the ones who who are on the whole making that argument? Well, that 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 something Aaron and I have talked about for a very long time is that maybe at the end the best argument for freedom and also the evolution that comes with freedom is that it minimizes the damage of being wrong. And in this, as opposed to governments, will maximize the damage of being wrong because we're all wrong often. I mean, if we're all humans in government or markets, we have a bad idea and, and we, we we run with it and it doesn't work. But that and that would be a dead end in the evolutionary change if you if you let the evolution go. But if you have government with this unique ability, wrongness can go on for a very long time at very high cost. Yeah, let me let me tell you a story about a, a really rather inspirational guy who's just left the UK government but has been there for five years. It was brought in from the IT industry called Mike Bracken and he was given the problem five years ago of these gigantic IT projects that – where hundreds of billions of dollars are spent and then you end up trashing the whole thing at the end because it doesn't work. Uh, government projects. Government projects, like exactly. Gov, exactly. UK. Yeah, exactly. The same sort of thing. Uh, and, and, and he has basically kind of stopped that in the UK. I mean, we haven't had any of those in, in recent years. And, and I, I've asked him how did he achieve this uh, and it's all about saying instead of designing the whole system, you've got to fail fast. Get a, get a little bit of out there, test it in the real world, get another little bit out there, try it, try, keep trying it on a small scale, uh, not just piloting. You know, that's piloting the whole thing. He's saying do, do it in stages uh, and test it at every stage. Uh, evolve it uh, essentially. Uh, but I, I was very struck by his use of the word failure there. You know, uh, I want you to fail. Uh, you know, I want you to, to discover what's wrong with this. Uh, you know, don't say it's not ready to be used yet. Go out there and test it and fail fast. Fail, fail cheaply and fail fast was, was his motto. Uh, and I think he's had pretty big impact on, on it. I mean, I, he, he may be one of many examples, but uh, you know, his, his, uh, his model is now of interest to other countries around the world. I know that, you know, et cetera. So, so uh, I, th I think there are ways of, of doing it even within mono mon 
um, monolithic structures. Do you, does you fear that the more the government grows with this ex, this unique power of force, um, that it will constrain the evolutionary growth of society when there are a lot of more there are more entities out there that have this granted power and therefore are not going to be easy to get rid of, and so maybe we won't be evolving as fast as we might or as we could have. There's certainly an arms race between monopolistic and bureaucratic and uh, uh, anti-innovation uh, tendencies and the opposite, as it were. Uh, I think the good guys will stay one step ahead of the bad guys because as you've seen with the internet, you know, it was – it was out of the blocks and three quarters of the way down the track before government even realized it existed. <laughs> so it thank God, <laughs> thank God, and couldn't catch up and 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 regulate it. But then you take examples like genetically modified crops in Europe or uh, electronic cigarettes, and you see how vested interests working through monopolistic governments are managing to stifle innovation almost completely and keep keep new products out of certain markets almost completely and 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 yes i do worry um that the the the, the power of the, the the political power that not necessarily government but you know corporations can achieve through lobbying government often uh, is sometimes sufficient to to stop this process happening and when you then look at the history of innovation and the history of progress it's a pretty rare flower it's 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 you know it's in america in the 20th century it's in uh, renaissance italy in the 15th century it's in arabia it's in china it's not everywhere you know, it's in Holland in the 17th century, etc. But you know, you can imagine an asteroid landing on the wrong part of the world, and 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 suddenly there's nowhere doing this thing, and, and everybody is 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 run by um, uh, very uh, um, neophobic governments, as it were. Free thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.